I believe people should not go directly into cyber. I mean, the reason for this is cybersecurity is not a real industry in and of itself. People hate me for saying this. Some people can absolutely do it and some people absolutely can't. See, I'm not a father, but I like to post dad jokes. That makes me a bit of a faux pas. I love it. And I, I have to say from the industry, thank you so much for your service as a faux pas. That's, uh, that's great stuff. Hello, everyone, and welcome or welcome back to Cybersecurity Standup. Um, super excited because this is actually the kickoff point for season two. Um, very exciting. We've got a star guest, and I've also got a new co-host. Um, so we're going to jump right into some introductions um, because this season is just like jam-packed full of incredible people with incredibly different career journeys, different job titles, and we're, we just have like so much to share with you. Um, so in case you have forgotten in all this time, my name is Bronwyn Hudson. I'm your host for Cybersecurity Standup, and I'm my new co-host is actually my boss. Very exciting. Lauren Patrick, um, the Uptics Director of Community and Customer Marketing. Lauren, can you give us a quick little intro? Yes. Thank you, Bronwyn. And hello, cyber world. Uh, Lauren Patrick here, the newly minted Director of Community and Customer Marketing at Uptics. I've been in cybersecurity since 2020, and this is my third cyber startup. So very cool to be doing a podcast like Cybersecurity Stand Up and getting to talk with our experts like Dustin. Woo. Dustin, I will pass the baton to you. Hi, so I'm Dustin Haywood. I'm otherwise known in the industry as Evil Mog from Team Hashcat. I'm a password security researcher. And I'm also the chief architect of IBM's X-Force. So um, I started off my world actually oddly enough as a network engineer back probably about 15 years ago. Wound up doing a bunch of network defense contracting, wound up in Afghanistan hooking up uh, satellite gear, wound up somehow at a government-owned bank as a security analyst, and then got stolen to go work at IBM about seven years ago. So started off as a tester, moved my way up, became a senior technical staff member, then got promoted to chief architect about a year ago, and now here I am. I feel like so many of the sort of like cyber journeys that I hear of people going into very successful cyber careers, there's no linear path whatsoever. And it's a lot of moments of like, and then this happened. Um, you know, there's there's no like uh, you know, reasonable jumping off point. It's just like so wonderful to hear every time about how you got to where you are. Um, yeah. Do you have any, I mean, that's actually a lot of people ask what's your kickoff point in terms of what would you recommend people get in, like, for getting into cyber at this point in their lives, whether they're just graduating? Do you have a hot take on that? I, I do, actually. That in and my hot here. take is actually mildly controversial. Um, I believe okay. people should not go directly into cyber. Um, the reason for this is cybersecurity is not a real industry in and of itself. People hate me for saying this, but all cyber is is just, you know, Advanced security is like basically advanced system administration, advanced network engineering, advanced help desk. I recommend doing three to four years minimum in a general IT field, ideally customer facing role in an enterprise environment. So you get exposed to that sort of world and then move into, say, cybersecurity through a SOC or penetration testing. And the reason for this is you're going to hit a wall if you go straight in. Some people can absolutely do it. Um, some people absolutely can't. And if you want to have an easier way of advancing that, you know, conversion from general IT into, you know, security is far easier than going straight in. And it's interesting too, Dustin, we're hearing a lot of industry chatter about the lack of skilled workforce. There is no talent pipeline. And so I think a lot of people are like, I want to work in cybersecurity, but don't understand that they need to go work in a knock, like learn how to run a network before making that leap. So could you talk a little bit more about like any apprenticeships or internship programs you've seen that have really helped get people ready for one of those careers? Well, I'll describe mine. Um, I did mine back in 2006. This is back when like, my MCSA was from 2003, so don't judge. Um, but we did a program where it was basically six months in college, went through, you know, did like our CCNA, did our MCSA 2003s, did our Linux, and then we went through and we bid on a mock RFP and then went through the entire process of implementation, did all the business aspects of things. Um, from there, I then went into, you know, working at a knock and then went in through the IT route. Um, the reason for all this was you build all these general IT skills. And when I'm doing penetration testing on Active Directory, for example, I still lean on these weird esoteric Active Directory skills. And so really find out where you want to be in cyber and then build everything upon that. It's like playing Dungeons and Dragons. You don't go straight into one of the prestige classes. You need to rely on your baseline class. You can't just be like a straight 1000% level 20 rogue warrior. Like it just doesn't happen that way. Okay. Off the back of that, I want to detour us a tiny bit because 
As a huge fan of yours on Twitter, I'd love to get the backstory on Evil Mog, the name, the the reputation, the memes. Can you tell us about that while we're talking about D&D? Absolutely. So Evil Mog actually came from uh, my gamer tag back in the day. It was Mog the Moogle from Final Fantasy VI. It was also the first aircraft I ever flew. I'm actually a licensed glider pilot, and CG Mog was the aircraft I flew. Um, from there, I went to work for a bank, and they had a rule against doing cybersecurity research under your real name. So when I was working with Team Hashcat back from 2011 to about 2015, or Evil Mog was the handle, but I started off as just Mog on IRC. I met a guy named Matthew O'Gorman who had the same handle. So because he had the name, we did deconfliction. I became Evil Mog. He became Good Mog. Um, and then in 2015, my name, my cluster size, my company got leaked in a paper actually for Unix 2015. And so I just went full public with my identity. And the company's like, look, I guess it's out there. Here's this guy doing these things. So that's how I became famous on that. Um, as for the memes, um, I get really bored and I like to go browse Facebook or Meta as they call themselves now. And I belong to a number of dank meme and dad joke um, groups. And nice. see, I'm not a father, but I like to post dad jokes. That makes me a bit of a faux pas. Um, but I like to go repost those on Facebook to go make everyone laugh really hard because, I mean, this industry gets – we work long hours. We work really hard. And so rather than posting things that are, you know, st stir crap and, you know, start fights on Twitter, I just like to make people laugh. Love it. And I, I have to say from the industry, thank you so much for your service as a faux pas. That's, uh, that's great stuff. And we're happy to have you on there. I think that's actually how I discovered you or, you know, heard about you. So that's wonderful. Um, so let's switch gears here a little bit um, and kind of dive into the, the meat of it. I know it's sort of an, a little bit of an over-asked question, but I do want to know, like at this moment in time, you know, we're almost well, three quarters of the way through this year. That's kind of intense. Um, right now in 2023, what is your monster under the bed in this industry? What is the one big thing that's keeping you up at night? What's the, what should we be worried about? So my monster under the bed has been the same monster I've had under the bed for the last 10 years. And that's people reuse passwords between sites, like say their social media and their corporate world. And the problem is you as a consumer have no way of knowing if the site you're logging on to has proper cybersecurity controls. Now, here's the thing. Breaches are a fact of life. It's not a question of if you're going to breach, it's a question of when and how you deal with it. And this applies to you know everything broadly. I mean, with the appropriate controls, yeah, you're going to keep things at bay. But as I tell people, there's two types of companies in this world. Those that have been breached and those that have been breached and don't know it yet. So with this... People go and they extract passwords out everywhere, and they wind up cracking these passwords, and then they reuse these passwords. And the industry doesn't make anything really better than a password, right? So, you know, if everyone gave out um, pa enterprise password managers and devices for retrieving those and automatic ways of cycling secrets, this world would be so much better. Because the average person has, what, 400 different sites they log into? I'm not going to remember 400 different passwords. It's just not going to physically happen. So I need you know, that. This is the problem now is people will reuse a common variant of a password between systems, and then they'll change companies every couple of years, and they'll reuse that same baseline password. And so, you know, people really are the weakest link, but there's no real way of enabling people to not be the weakest link at this point other than, yeah. you know, every company. Like, for example, ours. I don't normally name brands, but our company buys one password for every company or for every employee automatically. And so they give you an enterprise version and a personal version for your entire family. I don't know any of my passwords because I they're long and they look like line noise. That's the only good password. So I have a follow-up question for you, Dustin, regarding cyber hygiene and the lack of adoption of MFA, you know, both in businesses and on the personal side. Like, are you having to coach your family on, like, for the love of God, please turn on the MFA? Or oh, yeah. What are you sort of seeing out there among consumers? Well, uh, for example, I've been having to be a coach my family, coach the industry for three years solid. We went to every single conference we get our hands on and ran a demo on the Kraken password cracker. And all it was was us demonstrating that, you know, people can pull sleight of hand and authentication systems and store passwords in insecure ways. Um, so realistically, it's just, we've been telling people, get a password manager, telling companies, go get one, get one for your people. It's a combination of password manager plus MFA. Because here's the thing, MFA on its own, 
you know, there's various implementations of MFA and some are better than others. Like SMS-based MFA is largely useless because of SIM jacking. You've got email-based MFA. If someone's already got into your email, I mean, that's largely useless too. But the problem comes down to people lose fobs, people lose phones, phones get stolen, people drop phones in you know, puddles and they get destroyed. I mean, so there's no real clean way of handling this, which is why it's down to make sure you've got backups to your password manager seeds, make sure you've got a password manager, make sure things are random, make it easy to cycle passwords, but this is an unsolved problem in the industry. And you know what, when I retire in 10, 15 years, it'll still be an unsolved problem. Yeah. You look too young to retire in 10 to 15 years. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Goals though, yeah. <laughs> and when it comes to... You know, some like like so the, the chatter around passwordless authentication. I'd I'd love to hear your sort of take on that as well because I feel like people love this idea but don't really know what they mean necessarily. They like the idea of biometrics, but what's your take on like is that is that a future that mm -hmm. we can look forward to? Is that the totally you know false promise? The whole idea of passwordless. Exactly. So I mean, biometrics, for example, we'll start with that. Biometrics is more about your ID. Like I can't change my fingerprints when someone lifts them off. Um, Little known fact, people who work with pineapples don't actually have fingerprints. They get burned off by a chemical called bromelain um, after about five years or so. So they're completely smooth. That's why they can't be fingerprinted. Um, but you know, things like passwordless, all passwordless is is just it abstracts away the password. There's still a shared secret stored in the system. There's still something in the back end that still needs to be cycled. Like if you look at Active Directory, passwordless, Windows Hello authentication, there's still a secret stored in a seed somewhere. And if a hacker you know, managed to penetrate the system and get all the uh, you know password hashes out of the back end. Even though they're abstracted away with passwordless, there's still authentication secrets that need to get cycled. So, and there's no things like Open ID Connect make this easier. And there's you know things like you know sign on with my social media sign ons. It's just kicking the can up the road to somebody else. Like for example, when a major cloud provider got breached, that I'm not going to name on this because I don't want to go kick them when they're down. Um, there's still passwordless employed, but yeah, you know, their signing keys got yeah. leaked. So it's just you know, shifting the you know, responsibility elsewhere. Uh, so it's still going to be a problem in some way, shape, or form. And then, oh, sorry, I froze for a second. Um, one other question that I have kind of in the same vein is that I think one of the most recent NIST recommendations is basically like get rid of all the arbitrary complexity requirements, that kind of stuff. But like that the additional thing that you can do as an organization is implement credential screening. Can you speak to that as well? So yeah, so credential screening is things like making sure your passwords haven't been reused in a breach. Now, I have a mild issue with some of the NIST recommendations. Okay. Uh, this is a spicy take. And this issue is that NIST says you no longer need to cycle authentication secrets, except for you know case or you know, instances of a breach. You're never going to know when you need to get breached. Privileged credentials need to be cycled at least annually, if not more, or if not, you know, at point of use. Um, and then every time somebody leaves, like every time you lose a backup admin, you should honestly cycle passwords. Um, and, and then also, unless you have proper threat modeling in place to map out an unprivileged user to a privileged user, you almost need to treat all the users in your environment as privileged users. So, yeah, I mean... Password cycling becomes an issue, but that's where password managers kick in. This process should be automated and seamless so the users don't see them because you're right. The arbitrary, I'm going to change my password every 90 days. I'm going to go from summer 2021 to spring 2021 to fall 2021, you know, et cetera, um, and rotate through these. Every time the year change will be 2022, 2023, or I'll use like my company name and then some arbitrary number. If you make it so that the passwords can be extremely complex and just rotate it, without the user's knowledge or you know, need and you know, automate that whole process. Like for example, if I was a CEO, this is a really bad take. I would go spend a thousand dollars in every single person and buy them a cell phone. I would install our enterprise password manager on that cell phone. That'd make sure they have full access to access the systems. Because here's the thing, if they, you know, don't, if they can't remember a 20 character password, which they shouldn't be able to, or even say a, 14 character one that's randomly cycled, so it's easy to enter, that solves most of my problem. If that thing rotates in the back end, is automatically synced, that deals with it. That's basically passwordless without all the issues of here's a reuse secret. So let's just jump into the next question, Dustin, because this is something that I've always geeked out on is just what the IBM X-Force actually is. So for those who might be somewhat new to cyber, could you talk a little bit about the IBM X-Force? What's your role specifically? And what's the day in the life of an X-Force team member like? 
So X-Force is IBM's outsourced security services arm. We actually are part of IBM Consulting. Um, so we have three major groups. X-Force Red is the penetration testers, adversarial simulation, application testers, social engineers, basically the hackers. We break into um, anything from planes, trains, automobiles, medical devices, to uh, corporate environments, and everything in between. Um, so that's the X-Force Red side of things where I started off. Um, every day is different because every target's different. So you'll do, you know, you do a couple weeks on an engagement, write your report. Sometimes our adversarial simulation folks are doing six months on an engagement doing prep, doing um, you know, security research and malware development. Then we have our incident responders, X-Force IR. These folks respond to breaches. They do everything from active threat assessments to incident response. These are the folks when the company is having their worst day, we come in to calm them down and get them back to normal. Because, yeah, a breach is going to be the most stressful time in the world, um, and we're there to help. We also have our cyber range based out of there, so we'll bring in people from all over the world, put them all together, and put them through a simulated breach. So once that's done, um, we have that group, and then we also have our threat intelligence team. So that's our research and development, malware reverse engineers, the people who find the really scary stuff and then put out intelligence that our other groups use. So that's the three major parts of X-Force. And then me as the chief architect, I handle a lot of the customer interconnections. Um, so if you have, we need to connect to do a pen test, instant response. I handle all the technology and tooling for those groups. Very cool. And so you've been there for a hot minute, over six years now, right? And with sort of crossing the chasm with this mass adoption of, or sorry, mass awareness, really, of what threat actors are capable of following COVID, the rise of phishing emails, things like that. How has the X-Force changed? Are you working more with consumer brands where in the past it was more B2B? We just love to know more about that. Honestly, we were working with everybody. I mean, our client makeup hasn't changed. It's crossed everything from small consumer brands to massive enterprise to ITOT to aerospace and defense. Um, security awareness is really everybody's problem, and it's a business problem, and it reflects that with the quality of our testing. Like, we've always been known for being – you know, the groups that the hire is nothing but the best. And so we've always been, you know, drawn into these really interesting engagements so we can see things that most groups typically wouldn't see. That's really fascinating. And so if you could go back in time, like five or 10 years, I guess, you know, at the start of your cyber career, like, what would you tell yourself? Like, if you had a crystal ball, like, what would you wish the tea leaves would have read for you? I mean, so when I first started the cyber, I was, a, you know, junior analyst working for a bank, and I put in some absolutely insane overtime. Um, and then every minute I had that was spare, I'd be putting into learning. And uh, the problem was, after you do all that nonstop, you eventually start to burn out. And my burnout hit extremely hard before I went over to X Force. Um, that burnout was shall we say epic i was wearing bunny slippers into the office every single day out of just sheer annoyance for other things to express my disdain um i felt the stress induced panic attack while i was doing the job of four people after a couple of my teams got let go and i didn't think i could really go anywhere because i couldn't get my head out of where i was at um I went on medical leave for a couple of weeks, and I kept getting called out during my leave. So I said, heck with it, called up my friends over at X-Force that I ran into at a conference and uh, decided to jump. So I guess what I tell myself is, you know, no one's going to remember that you worked 80-plus hours a week because if you drop dead in the office, they're going to replace you the next day. Um, Work-life balance is absolutely critical, and despite the fact that everyone's got this pressure for always leveling up, you know, you're going to lose a good 10 years of your life if you try and do that. So experience the real world now because tomorrow may never come. <laughs> and that's a great segue to the next question, too. You know, you talked a little bit about burnout, wearing the bunny slippers into the office. Um, what information would you want to share with the InfoSec industry about how you balance, like, knowing when you're on the edge of burnout and knowing when it's time to give yourself that space, that self-care, if you will? You know, the moment you realize you're burning out, you're probably already very deep into the burnout cycle. You're not going to see it. Um, it starts off with little things like getting snappier than normal or you know, shunning away from friend groups. Everyone deals with burnout differently, though, and that's the thing. There's no one be-all, end-all solution. But if I could tell anybody, if your companies offer things like 
employee family assistance programs or you know the free mental health counseling you know back 10 15 years ago there was kind of a stigma around seeking mental health uh, you know i view it now these days as more of a tune up these days like you know you go and get your car checked out routinely you speaking to somebody about the nature of our job is a very healthy thing uh, you're going to see some things in this industry especially if you're working incident response that you're going to wish you could unsee and you unfortunately can't. Um, so starting before you get burnt out is far healthier than waiting until you're burnt out and then you just flatline. Preach it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it took me a good year and a half to come back from that hardcore burnout. Thankfully, IBM was awesome. They're like, yeah, you know, here's your 40 hours a week, and if you work beyond that, we're going to start like yelling at you till you work less. Um, here's mandatory wow. vacations. I've been like assigned on vacation once. I'm like, look, you've noticed you haven't taken your vacation. Here's your bonus. Your vacation starts now. We're cutting off your access. So like, <laughs> that's just kind of you know, the type of groups we work with. And I wish every employer was like that because your people are your primary resource. I don't care about tooling. I mean, we can replace tools. I can't replace people. And I want to double tap on what you referenced too with the burnout cycle. I've never heard that term before. Yeah, but it happens, so what are right? Sort of, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, what are like the stages? The like you mentioned, like if you think you're burned out, you're already there. But like, what have you learned to sort of like the precursors of like those early stages of burnout? Warning? Yeah, it, it's it's red flags are different for everybody, right? Like some people, I start getting testy with. Um, I start you know finding the bad and absolutely everything. The worldview just sort of sort of subtly shifts, and then you feel this um, need to work harder to get out of it, and that working harder makes it even worse. And so you get into the cycle, and it's worse for pen testers. Pen testers are prone to burnout for one simple thing. Popping a system is like this massive adrenaline rush. Um, you go and you pop a system, or you spend like thousands of hours, you know, beating your head against the wall, trying many, many things. Fail, 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 fail. Oh my God, I suck at this. All of a sudden, pop, you get that adrenaline rush, you get the endorphin rush, you're on top of the world, and you're at this top of this mountain, and then all of a sudden, you start trying more things, you get through, and then you drop back down into this trying, 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 trying. So you're on this constant cycle of up and down, up and down with your moods, and just the naturally doing that will eventually burn somebody out. You need to take those breaks if you don't go take a vacation. Like your three to four weeks a year are absolutely mandatory or else your body just physically can't handle it. Um, incident responders, same deal. There's Our body puts out a stress hormone called cortisol. Company gets breached. All of a sudden, everyone's stressed. Cortisol causes confirmation bias. That confirmation bias creates more problems. All of a sudden, you're now into this downward spiral. The best advice I got when I was doing network engineering was every time you have a computer problem, go out, take a break, go for a smoke break. Now, I'm not going to advocate smoking. That's absolutely terrible in this day and age. I think everyone should quit. But when I I actually managed to quit from three packs a day, it was rough back when I was in that industry. But I mean, it, 15 years now, nice and clean. It's been hard. But when I quit, I still grabbed a cup of coffee, went out with the smokers in the smoke pit, and had conversations to get that reset in the break. Here's the thing. There's no mm. problem in IT that cannot wait 15 minutes. Even in the worst outage in the world, unless there's lives on the line, basically – any mistake you make in that 15-minute golden window is just going to amplify the problem. Take a step back, hands off the keyboard. If you're going to write a cranky email, take a step back, let it reread. You just need to reset to get over that initial biological issue. It's nothing against you. It's just pure biology. I think that's like really good advice. The idea of regulating your nervous system when a crisis is happening is, I would say, blanketly good advice across all industries, but particularly this one. That's how it feels to me. Yeah, particularly salient. Yeah. yeah. And that's the only thing. That's the only thing. Everything else is technical I can teach. I cannot teach that learning to reset. It's all about self-awareness, and everyone needs to go practice things. Like, go do uh, yoga. Go do um, this flotation tax. Go get a massage. Go out and go for a walk. Yeah. Do something to just get yourself out of sitting at the keyboard for 80 hours a week because sitting is the new smoking. Yeah. So quick question for you then, Dustin. Could you talk us through – what you've actually done to decompress following a breach in real life when you were in that high stress situation. Did you take the PTO afterwards? Or if you didn't have time for PTO, what did you do? For so I collect extremely dangerous and adrenaline sport hobbies. Um, I'm a licensed <laughs> pyrotechnician. 
uh, special effects Whoa. pyrotechnician Canada. So I do things like burning down structures for Alberta's regional burning man called Freezer Burn. I am a scuba diver, so I go scuba diving. Um, I ride motorcycles. I'm a licensed glider pilot. I do anything other than IT to go decompress um, I, because I like the adrenaline, but it needs to be a different way to release everything. So, you know, things go sideways. You know, I used to do Taekwondo for a bit. You know, nothing beats going in and, you know, getting the crap beaten out of you uh, after, a, <laughs> you know, to get the full contact to combat out of there. But it's just anything to get some kind of a release. I know some people who do sit there do cross stitch. I know some people who go volunteer at pet shelters. I know folks who draw, do painting, do art. Um, you know, hey, if playing video games is your thing, go for it. Um, just do something that is not directly related to the IT. And yeah, sure, you want to go learn on the side, do it, but do things in moderation. You know, know yourself, make sure you get fed, eat a good proper meal, don't live off junk food, these kind of things. <laughs> I, this is such good advice. I need to hear this every day because these these things, like not only the activities that we do, the hobbies that we invest in, but also eating a good meal and like respecting your own body. I mean, I, I need that. I need it because it's a practice, just like anything else. It's something that you have to invest in. You have to pay attention to that if you, I mean, and it's discipline led, just like a lot of other things are as well. It's not like something easy that finally you crack the code and you're like, oh yeah, I can eat and it's great. And I've like figured it out. You have to just keep practicing. Oh, yeah. I actually set an alarm yeah. on my um, watch as well as the calendar entries goes stop and eat or go take a break really? and like that's the only way i do it because unlike or like most people outlook is my mother if outlook doesn't say it's happening it's not happening so it needs to get in the calendar <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, I actually have a calendar reminder to journal every day just to sit down take 30 minutes and write yeah, and that's the only way. If it doesn't wind up in the calendar, it's not happening. I mean, tomorrow never comes, but that 15-minute meeting that shows up in your calendar absolutely does. Guaranteed. So, yeah. <laughs> this is actually an interesting segue, too, because one of the things I want to talk with you about today was the rise of AI. You know, mm -hmm. like these tools like calendars, you know, um, chat GPT, like they're supposed to make our lives easier. But on the flip side, we see threat actors using these tools against us, that they're able to access your Outlook calendar and get into your network that way, that the phishing emails have gotten even more sophisticated. So what do you see as the big pros and cons for AI and where do you see it going? AI is really poorly defined. We don't really have general AI these days. We have limited versions of AIs. In this day and age with chat GPT and now what's next, we have large language models. We've got, previous to that, we had neural networks. Um, before that, we had really large if-then-else statements that were performing things. But AI itself is really about augmenting human capabilities as opposed to outright replacing humans. Um, you know, the output from some of these models, they lack context. And so, yeah, they can be used to, you know, a great use for AI is, for example, explaining what a payload does, because they can go through and look things up faster than I can. Can it write a payload from scratch? Not necessarily. Can it write code? Uh, poorly. So I don't really see it as replacing folks, but I definitely see it as augmenting our capabilities as long as we don't rely on it too much. So yeah, attackers are using it, but they're using it poorly as well. Mm. What about concerns like with vishing and being able to do deep fakes and things like that? I mean, deep fakes are definitely scary and vishing is always terrible, but this all comes down to social engineering. And I think no matter what, you know, social engineering will always bite us because people are you know, crafty and we're really good about convincing other people to do our things. You know, end of the day, it's just, you know, wetware and biology and people want to help out others. Um, you know, using things like your know, fear and coercion tactics or the social engineering techniques or, you know, faking things out using AI. Yeah, that's a vulnerability, but it's always been, it's just the forgeries are getting better. Mm, preach it. And I think that's going to be the really interesting thing, too, is to see, like, how sophisticated these social engineering schemes are going to get. Because when we saw COVID pop off, everyone used COVID as a way to socially engineer people to give up their checking information mm -hmm. for, you know, their stimulus checks and things like that. So what do you sort of see as, like, the next big trend that threat actors might exploit? Well, I mean, they're, they're always looking for the newest thing, right? The, the new trend changes every five minutes based off popular culture. So, I mean... It, if I was a threat actor, I'd look at the most you know, coming up uh, 
popular culture trends, set up an analysis pipeline to give new prefix or pretexts, run testing scientifically, determine which ones work and which ones don't against random audiences, even if they're not real targets, and then tune the attacks that way. I mean, that's kind of the pipeline we use when we're attacking people. Um, same way for the defenders is, you know, start developing uh, lists of here's what's new in popular culture, here's what's new coming out. You know, build a threat intelligence pipeline like we've got at X-Force, and you know, determine what the new uh, defenses are. But really, the only real defense against this is a healthy sc- a dose of skepticism and uh, always uh, you know, developing procedures around these. They're going to get bypassed, but an unpopular opinion I have is if your entire environment can get taken down by somebody social engineering your help desk, your controls around the help desk weren't necessarily great. Um, privileged users internally should not be able to go take down your entire environment. You need to watch your insiders because insider threat is just as dangerous as an external threat. Whether it's through them intentionally going evil or them being social engineered, your privileged users are definitely going to be a problem. And it's interesting because even companies that go through a SOC audit, like don't always have the right admin permissions in place, like they don't have the right data classification. So what advice would you give to someone who is just getting started with setting up those permissions to make sure that someone doesn't have too much access? Honestly, it comes down to a number of things. Um, really understanding your business is the most important part. You know, ask yourself, what if this particular business process broke down? What if a trusted person started doing something bad? What secondary or third or tertiary controls do you have to detect or prevent this? Um, everything comes down to risk. And you can do a couple things with risk. You can either accept the risk, you can mitigate the risk, or you can transfer the risk. Um, but that's really about it. So it all comes down to a risk-based approach. And I would say you don't want somebody transferring air miles off to somebody else if they get called in. Well, do they have audits? Do they have limits on how much they can transfer? It goes more beyond just simple IT. It goes into actual business controls, and then that should tie down to your IT controls. Love it. So um, self-serving question here, but you know, as we look at all the different tools that can help with those controls, why is it so important to have that unified view of your threat intelligence and vulnerability management? You know, there's a lot of players in this space that say they can do endpoint detection from code to cloud and know if it's an actual threat actor or an intern that's calling the API wrong. What do you think is sort of like the be-all, end-all, like pie-in-the-sky solution that we really need the whole industry to rally around? Well, the problem you're going to have is every industry is different. And every solution I've seen, including yours, no offense, has been all around the IT controls and the IT operations of things. They don't really tie down into actual business risk. So things like you're not going to see, hey, somebody transferred out a bunch of Excel data via email or some side channel they downloaded onto a USB stick. You're going to see the controls to detect the, hey, USB writing is enabled, but you're not going to see that end-to-end unless you truly understand your business. And the problem is nobody really understands their business at the IT level, and nobody at the IT level truly understands, you know, like – both ways around. So that's where we're seeing the rise of groups like BSOs and business risk folks getting tied into the IT world. But until, you know, IT folks traditionally have hated talking business. It freaks us out. We hate people. You talk to business folks, they hate the IT world because they think we're all a bunch of uh, dungeon-dwelling gremlins that, you know, sit in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's all about learning those soft skills. I'm seeing this improve now with this focus on soft skills. But, you know, People will also look at, hey, I'm some company trying to sell some new thing or push to go fast and break things. They're not going to truly go into understanding their business model tied to IT risk because they're incentivized on publishing first. So that's where we're seeing a lot of this is, hey, I need to go deliver. You know, People see IT as a roadblock. Here's the thing. The brakes on a race car make it go faster, not slower. Because they truly understand the risk on this. So it goes back to the business. We need to have a more business-centric IT approach. Otherwise, we're just repeating the same thing. You, know, you offload to an MSSP. It's going to be very transactional. It needs to be very partnership-based. So while your tools help, and I love your tools, by the way, it's you're never going to get that level of, you know, hey, here's some business risk tied to, say, uptics, for example. And so let's actually double tap on that for a second, because I think that the roles of a BISO and a CISO have become an increasingly blurry line. Mm-hmm. So when you think about like who's actually responsible for monitoring risk, could you talk about like sort of the ideal state of like how that should be operating? I mean, risk acceptance levels should be honestly owned by the um, CEO at the outright. You know, mm-hmm. here is 
what we w- are willing to accept, and all units of the organization, regardless of where they are, should be working towards that. Um, from there, then it's a collaboration between the CISO, CEO, CISO, et cetera. Did I, lose? I love that because it, it you're good. You're okay, good cool. with me. So it does, yeah, um, to close the loop and thinking about that top down approach, like, We've seen CEOs almost just ignore risk, right? They Mm -hmm. just sort of brush it off and say, oh, my CISO is going to handle that. And they'll come to my board meeting with a budget of the tools that they want to go buy. And then my board is going to question that budget and why they need more resources. It seems like we saw a lot of those. Exactly. And the problem you're going to see is security and IT should not be a cost center. Security and IT are business enablers. We are there to make sure that the business, you know, functions. No company in the world has their primary business operation of keeping IT up, other than maybe a large cloud hyperscaler. They're there to make money, which means everyone in the company is there to make money and support that mission. Now, when you tie things like, hey, we've been breached to absolute loss, that's making sure we can't make money. So it's it's a different way of framing risks. And that's, you know, you know, like you look at a consulting organization, we're there to make sure our customers are successful. In return, they pay their bills and they stop paying their bills if we get breached. So it all ties down to that kind of a world instead of, you know, hey, IT technical controls. Because quite frankly, nobody cares what IT technical controls from the at the top of level. Preach it. All right. So um, I have two fun questions to close the loop on this conversation. If you could hire one fictional character as a head of cybersecurity, who would it be and why? You know, I've been thinking about this, and honestly, I still don't have a real answer. I mean, I'd probably want to hire a telepath, to be honest, as my head of cybersecurity. Ooh. You know, uh, pick any one of them that are really good at what they do, um, and that's or, – or even an empath, somebody can sense other people's emotions. That way, when they go into business meetings or board meetings, we can drive to the meat of things because people are terrible – you know, communicating. And if I could break down communication barriers using those techniques, I could do a lot of damage. Do a lot of damage, but in a very positive way. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, exactly, right? Like, you know, I could demolish your bureaucracy, red tape and paperwork and get people rowing in the same way and just, you know, dominate the industry. It'd be awesome. Um, Similar similar vibe. Um, But if you yourself could use any superpower to improve cybersecurity, would you choose similar, similar skills? No, I choose something more self-serving in my case. I would choose the ability to instantly decompress and relax. Um, this way, when things are getting sideways, I could stop myself from burning out and keep doing better things. I would not want to be able to see into people's yeah, heads. Yeah. That's a burden that would just completely fry me. But, you know, if I could have the instant thing where I could just, like, you know, tap my ears and go woo and be, like, instantly relaxed and calm for a meeting, I would tolerate so many more meetings that way. And I love much that. Happier. A way to just, like, instantly decompress, bring yourself all the way down. Beautiful. Yep. Mm-hmm. Switch. Love it. Cool. So, Dustin, we are at, almost at the end of our questions. I just have one final one for you. If you have the mic, if you could give any advice to the industry, our audience watching, what would it be? You know, the only real advice I have for everybody is just remember that Everyone at the other end of every conversation is human. They're coming from a different set of perspectives, a different set of objectives to you. And conflict will naturally arise in the IT industry, especially when you have people who are incredibly passionate. If you find yourself getting heated or not quite meshing up correctly, take a step back, relax, talk a little bit less in the meeting and sit there and truly listen and then come back to things, you might find barriers tend to break down better. Um, The the other piece of advice I'm going to give is don't be afraid to say, I don't know, but I will find out. Um, That's how I've gotten so far in my career. Um, Yeah, don't be afraid to take a risk. That's powerful. Yeah, beautiful. I feel like you've really given a lot of uh, extremely widely applicable applicable advice in this episode. I I really appreciate that. I think anyone who listens is going to be able to take away a lot of a lot of good nuggets from this one. Really nice. Awesome. Yeah, and that's the thing. I just want the world to get better. I mean, I am going to retire in 10, 15 years. It's just going to happen. And so I've been taking a lot to like going to like CPTC, CCDC, talking to students, passing on this bit of knowledge so that, you know, when I'm, you know, in my 60s playing golf, people can, you know, take these forward. Sounds with the like rest you're going to be world. 60 and doing scuba diving and other uh, high adrenaline activities. Actually, golf, I'm not sure, is up your alley, huh? 
I mean, oh, I like mini golf a lot, though. So, I mean, I can sit there. And be, <laughs> I don't like real size, full size golf. I know there's something about it doesn't go, Love it. but I can do mini golf Love all it. day The long. colorful balls really help. Yeah. Man, Dustin. <laughs> Yeah, for an evil mog, you're doing a lot of good. Yeah, that's uh, the, the evil part is actually more ironic or uh, joking on a number of things. I mean, I got the term when I was actually on the defensive side of the world before I went offensive, so it was kind Amazing. of a joke. <laughs> um, Dustin, thank you so much for your time, and thanks for being patient with me as I have these uh, various situations happening. Um, we really appreciate your time. Appreciate you coming on the uh, first episode of the season. Um, it's been a real blast, and um, can you tell us just as a sign-off, where can people find you? Uh, so I'm on Twitter, I'm evil underscore mog on Twitter, or if I'm on LinkedIn, I'm just evil mog. So that's E V I L M O G. Um, follow me on Twitter for all the random dad jokes and random memes. I guarantee you the majority of them are, P- are PG 13 and or clean. I try and filter out the bad ones. So you should be able to laugh. There's also a lot of cat pictures. So feel free to uh, get overwhelmed by the cuteness. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Thank Love you so it. much. And we will see you next time on Cybersecurity Stand Up. <laughs>